Okay, everyone. Um, this is Sarah Burns uh, speaking, and today we're going to have Adrian Wittal, who's a, a neuropsychologist uh, with the BrainWorks program with the Kids for Cancer Society. And I've had the pleasure of um, meeting with Adrian probably three or four years ago. It might be 10 years ago, Adrian, um, uh, to talk about <laughs> it is. Okay, to talk about children who have hearing loss who have survived cancer treatment. And um, uh, it was such an enlightening conversation. We then invited her to speak to um, um, the people who used to work with Rex. And um, it would be really good to uh, have me come back and speak to the group as a whole. And I'm going to turn off the microphones here. Um, please be sure your microphones are off, and if I remember correctly, did I turn myself off? We're good now? Yep. Okay. Mute, your microphone will be red. So just to let you know, even though the line is through, it'll be red if it's muted. So I'm going to turn this over to Adrian. And Adrian, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. She's speaking to us from uh, Toronto, and where it's, I believe, 5:30 her time. And thank you, Adrian, for joining us today. Well, Sarah, thank you for inviting me. Um, this is my first time doing a presentation this way, so I'm I'm not confident in my in my volume, but I trust that someone will tell me if you can't hear me, right? Um, so I, Could you speak a little bit louder or a little closer to the That'd be great. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, my voice often tends to drop when I'm speaking. Okay. So um, I'm excited to be here. And then I struggled with trying to figure out what I could share with you in just one hour. Um, my my friends and colleagues tell me that I'm a bit of a of a nerd and I can talk about these things for hours and I always assume everyone is as excited as me um, in learning all of all of these kinds of things. So I, I hope that um, some of some of this talk uh, is exciting and um, and 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 interesting and. Um, and I, my, uh, I'd like to share my contact information with you all. If there are, if if there are ever times that you'd like to know more, if you'd like to consult about a child, as as Sarah said, I'm representing the BrainWorks program, which provides this kind of information liaisons and consultations with families and children with cancer or who have ever been treated for cancer and brain tumors, um, um, to help with uh, educational and academic challenges. So hopefully, this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Um, Today, I'd like to share with you just some of the challenges that uh, the children going through cancer treatment and survivors will have returning to school, and then talk a bit about what some of the warning signs are that you may pick up as educators or people assessing students that a, uh, that a student may be starting to have some difficulties that might be related to their cancer treatment or the after effects of cancer. I think every presentation starts with some with some numbers and some incidents um, kinds of information. So, wanted to tell you that in our in the northern Alberta region, so that's uh, north of Red Deer, approximately 85 children are diagnosed with cancer every year, and that's children 16 and younger. Kids over 17 are counted as adults, and yet they're still in grade 11 and 12. So th this number is larger. There's also about 20 students in Red Deer North that are also diagnosed with brain tumors, um, which uh, in, in many cases are, are often treated with, with treatment that's similar to cancer treatment. And we'll be talking about some of the issues that happen with those students. Um, if, so that's half the province. If you multiply those numbers times two, you'll get a rough idea of what Alberta has um, in terms of incidence. The most common types of cancer in youth under the age of 19 uh, the number one is is leukemia, and which which is a blood type of cancer. I think it's probably the one that we all think of. It's the most common one. Um, the next most common one are cancers of the brain and the central nervous system, followed by lymphoma, which is another kind of um, whole body cancer. 
these three cancers are also the top three cancers that are most likely to cause learning both short-term and long-term learning problems for students. The estimates are that 75% of students with these types of cancers will at least have short-term learning difficulties related to treatment, and a smaller proportion will struggle with, with, with lifelong learning difficulties related to treatment. Um, some of the reasons for that is the kind of treatment that we use for cancer, and, and that includes things like chemotherapy, which is giving a drug that impacts your entire body system. Radiation therapy, uh, in terms of, it, it can be, again, anywhere in your body, but here, when we're talking about learning issues, it would be radiation treatment to the brain. Um, same with the chemotherapy, it's not that it's traveling your whole body and that's what's causing the learning difficulties. It's, when chemotherapy is, it, it has to include your brain for it to be whole body. So it's, it's the impact that it has on the brain. Um, for students with uh, tumors, brain tumors, certain kinds of bone tumors, they will have surgery to their, um, to their brain and that can cause immediate learning difficulties or some long-term difficulties as well. And then finally, um, I think many, many of us have heard of things like stem cell trans transplants, bone marrow transplants. And, um, those can cause learning difficulties later on for students who, um, who fall into a certain high risk category, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and just as an aside, all the bone marrow transplants happen in Calgary. They don't happen in northern Alberta. So if you ever are working with a student who has a bone marrow transplant, they have, um, by force, they're living in, in Calgary for upwards of three to six months, and that's a lot of school that's being missed on top of everything else. So what are some of the common kinds of things that students will talk about when they're going through cancer treatment? Um, one of the things that we say at the hospital and at the Kids with Cancer Society is how important it is for students to continue going to school during treatment. Um, so many of them will say it's the one place that I can feel like everybody else. And, and you see in this student that talked about some of the difficulties they were having during treatment, at the end, at the end, that last sentence, I just want to be like everybody else. And that's the power of school. So um, I think perhaps that's why I'm so passionate and talk so much about um, the learning challenges that students may have, because if we can adapt um, the school program, that we, we give, we give this, all students a gift of being like everybody else during that school day, even if they do have to go home and do treatment or miss a few days of school each week to do treatment. Um, and that's a precious, I believe that's a precious, precious gift. So um, what are some of the nuts and bolts of, or what are some of the things that can really impact a student from a short term point of view? Um, there's something called peripheral neuropathy, which is due to, and um, these are three kinds of chemotherapy drugs, and they're, they're very, very common. In the kids with brain tumors will have this drug, children with, um, with leukemias will have this drug, and lymphomas as well. Um, these drugs, and Christine's and Blastin and Cisplastin, will, um, they impact the nerves in your arms, your hands, your feet, and your legs. So your hands and feet become weaker. So students will have will will develop some balance difficulties. But um, in terms of a more direct impact with school, many students will have difficulties work writing, especially writing for longer periods of time. If if a student is starting to learn handwriting and printing skills, they'll often come they'll they'll learn it more slowly. They'll complain of pain. Um, one really quick way to notice if this is happening is take a peek at the, um, the underside of the paper of the student who's been writing, because one way they cope to control the, this, the, the hand weakness is they put more pressure from the shoulder and the upper arm into writing. And so you'll see that pencil or pen mark making marks on the underside of the paper. And if that's happening, you know that there's some weakness here going on. Um, another treatment um, related side effect that causes learning problems are hearing changes. Um, Cisplatin uh, is, a, is a drug that can cause uh, loss of hearing in many students. Anywhere from high frequency hearing loss, that's a very common um, side effect with, with certain kinds of brain tumors because of this drug, to, to, more, um, to more pervasive hearing 
correct difficulties. And what we're starting to learn is that um, there are genetic markers where we will hopefully be much better able to predict which students will develop hearing problems because of treatment and then be able to sort of proactively address that more quickly. Radiation treatment can cause hearing problems for students um, with brain tumors as well. So that's something that needs to be watched all the time. Um, and the hearing changes don't happen immediately. They happen over time. We'll be talking about short-term problems that are, which are difficulties that you might anticipate during treatment and then long-term or late effect problems, which can take up to three to four years after treatment to, to really show them. So if you have a student whose hearing was, in, was fine in the first year after treatment, that doesn't mean that it will still be fine two or three years later. And then an, one very common short-term uh, learning-related difficulty is due to steroids. Steroids are used in a lot of treatment protocols um, to help with inflammation, to help with them, how to make the chemotherapy more effective. And it's, they're at doses that are high enough to cause changes in mood, changes in irritability, frustration. Um, they, they can lighten your sleep, so your, your sleep is not as restful. So then you have a very fatigued child in the classroom. And um, for those of you who are teachers, you know that it's the fastest way to cause attention problems is to deprive a student of some sleep. So you'll have a double whammy, so some irritability and difficulties focusing. And then the steroids themselves, during the, during the treatment with the steroids, there have been, um, they have noticed that students develop short-term attention difficulties during steroid treatment. So that's a, another place to be watching that. Um, so we, I think we've talked a little bit about some of these, some of these things that you notice right away. I wanted to um, talk a bit about the fatigue because we, we, I've been working in oncology since about 2001, and I used to think fatigue was more about my muscles and my and my body. But um, working here in oncology, I've just I've really learned that um, brains get fatigued. And when brains get fatigued, it impacts many, many things. Um, it impacts a, a student's ability, their, their balance becomes worse when they're fatigued. Their physical body might be might not be fatigued, but because their brain's been working all day. Um, oh my gosh, sorry. That's what happens when you use one computer for everything. Okay, am I back on? Sorry. Um, so this is a video of all the parts of our brain that are involved in focusing and paying attention. And if you were to turn your head to the side, you would be looking at that kind of a cut of your brain. So the, the, there's, there's the neck down at the bottom and you see the head. Um, and you see that virtually every part of your head of your brain is involved in some way in terms of focusing and paying attention. So um, a student who's, who's, who's undergoing cancer treatment is very vulnerable to mental fatigue. The good news is that it's the best way to work on fatigue sorts of things are small mini breaks. With physical fatigue, you need to sleep. We need eight hours of sleep to deal with the physical fatigue. But with the brain fatigue, changing activity, so you go from one subject to the next, that, can, that could be enough to give that brain a rest. Um, having them go and deliver something to the office, just getting out of the classroom for a few minutes, that's another rest. Uh, being able to do mindfulness or relaxation kinds of exercise, those, those are the most powerful kinds of rest. Ten minutes of those make a big difference in terms of helping a brain rest. The worst thing for a fatigued brain is to um, let them watch, you know, kind of sit them down in front of a TV or to be in a place uh, where it's very noisy, like um, a recess or a game, that's recreation, and that's super important. But in terms of mental fatigue, you really want to watch how many things am I being asked to pay attention to, focus on, and ignore, and try to at least for a few minutes cut down on that number. So one of the things I'll talk about with parents when I talk about attention difficulties is uh, I'll say, well, when you're having trouble focusing, you're not available for learning. It's the same as if you just aren't physically present in the classroom. Um, so 
And then we start to look, we start to talk about all the other kinds of things that might affect attention on a daily basis. And um, a big one is feeling sick. So we often kind of look to see how do we sort of balance the day so that um, they're at school when they're, they're feeling their strongest. Are they a morning person or an afternoon person? And then I always ask about what kind of medication somebody's on for nausea. You know, the chemotherapy and nausea go hand in hand. And virtually all of the anti-nausea medications, and most kids will be on them, cause fatigue. That's just a, that's just a huge um, side effect of that. So we're looking to see what can we do to balance those kinds of things. Um, mental fatigue doesn't always look like um, body fatigue. It can look like restlessness, and it can look agitation. A child, you could look and you swear that child is not tired at all. Um, so that's sometimes um, you really have to kind of judge it based on the quality of their focus and their ability to come back and uh, pay attention and ignore distractions. And if you notice that it's fluctuating and dropping, that's I would feel very comfortable calling that mental fatigue. So what happens to students who might only have short-term difficulties related to treatment due to some of the side effects of the medication that we're talking about and some of the medical um, and the brain fatigue? Treatment can take up to three years for a child with leukemia. Um, boys' treatment is a bit longer than girls' treatment. So three years of, of struggling with fatigue or some of these difficulties, you, you would see um, you're just falling, um, grades are falling. You'll, um, I often see students who have limited, who made limited progress in reading skills um, or their fine motor skills. So short-term supports the year after treatment in schools can be so powerful in helping that student catch up. Um, the other thing that is so powerful is to um, be, have consistent expectations for work for the student during treatment. Um, because at that point, to, to, to say, well, we're not, and sometimes that happens too, is that we feel, we feel concerned about the student and we don't want to push too hard. And then um, a student has a lot of catching up when, they, when they've been through treatment for two years. And then on the third year, everybody's kind of expecting them to bounce back and rebound. Um, I used to do assessments, um, IQ and academic achievement testing and attention testing um, the year after, the year that they finished treatment to get a baseline and then retest them one year later. And the change a student can make in that first year following treatment as they're building physical resilience skills, as they are suddenly much more available for learning than, they, than they've been for one, two, or even three years is remarkable. Um, so uh, if you had a very limited place to add extra intervention, that's the place to do it in that, in that year. Um, Helping, helping students catch up to that. If you had more, though, I'd give it all the way through. The, all the way through. If you could see me, you'd know that I'm laughing, and I'm confusing you a little bit. So, why am I pushing school and saying how important it is, and saying um, let's hold, let's let's help kids have um, expectations and 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 where they can. Incur, you know, if, if they can't attend a full day, let's do a half day, let's do three days a week, let's, let's really focus on school. It's not just for the social piece. Um, the good news about cancer treatment is that the five-year survival rates are now over 85%. The survival rates for leukemia, the most common childhood cancer, are, are over 90%. Um, Survival rates for children with, with brain tumors, when you collect, when you lump them all together, is about 75%. And that's because there's still certain kinds of brain tumors that are much more aggressive than, than the treatment we've been able to um, succeed with other kinds of brain tumors. So if we're talking about that, on average, 85% of children are surviving pediatric cancer, um, quality of life issues become much more important. Helping prepare that student for adulthood become much more important. Um, and then the other thing that becomes much more important is recognizing that certain kinds of treatment have long-term side effects that may not show up for 5, 10, or 15 years later. That matters less when you are when, when you're, um, 60 years old 
But when you're five years old and you have leukemia, we're talking about what you're helping prepare for someone or, or, or make accommodations for certain side effects when they turn 20 and 25 years old. So that's the place where research is really starting to focus on what can we do to minimize the long-term effects and what can we do to help support students so that they're successful in, in adulthood. So these are some of the, again, these are some comments that students have made as they were transitioning to being off treatment, from off treatment, sorry, onto, onto treatment. And the kinds of things that we hear, I hear the most are related to um, being able to work quickly, and being able to um, catch up. And then making sure that the, whatever source of help they could get that they could be invisible. So just like, just pretty much just like every, any other student in, in the classroom. So late effects, we were just talking about that. I call them side effects. So late effects are side effects that show up anywhere from three to 15 years following treatment. They can affect any part of a body. We're gonna be talking mostly about the psychological ones and the cognitive ones, the ones that affecting thinking, memory, and learning. We've talked a little bit about short-term hearing problems and how hearing difficulties can, take, can, can change and develop across three to several years. Um, same thing with vision. Vision difficulties, vision can change as a, as a result of radiation treatment. Um, their fertility difficulties are very common, especially for boys who receive treatment before puberty. Um, the changes to the bones, the heart, the lung, the gro growth, the face are more related to radiation treatment or certain kinds of chemotherapy, which may slow, which may, may slow growth down. And then we were talking about um, the, the peripheral neuropathy and how that can cause difficulties with fine motor skills and gross motor skills. In a, and in a small proportion of students, those difficulties continue. So with cognitive light effects, so those are changes in thinking skills. You, I'm looking at them for students with leukemia up to about four to five years following diagnosis. The most common age for leukemia are, ch are for children between the ages of three to five years old. So I'm doing assessments and I'm watching very carefully till they're anywhere from eight to 10 years old. Because at any time, those difficulties may arise. Um, late effects for students with brain tumors can happen much more quickly, and that's partly because of the radiation treatment, if they receive radiation treatment. So uh, I'll do an assessment initially after the surgery to remove the brain tumor, and then about one year after radiation treatment. And then I will continue to do those, those assessments till about three years post. Um, the lymph lymphoma follows the same kind of uh, assessment protocol as leukemia. Although the difficulties for students with lymphoma tend to be milder attention difficulties. And then osteosarcoma is something we didn't talk about. Those are the bone cancers. Those are the cancers where quite often someone has to have a limb removed because of that cancer. And students with the osteosarcomas, um, those difficulties tend to follow more a very a slower pace, like the leukemia is looking at something at four to five years post-diagnosis. And it's related, and those students tend to talk more about having trouble remembering things. And it, they're not, um, it's rare to see um, what I call true memory difficulties in students with leukemia, lymphoma, and bone cancer. What it is is more, are difficulties related to the ability to um, take information in and work with it, that working memory piece, which we'll be talking about, which is sort of that last step that you go through as you're trying to um, learn something and, and assign it to, to memory. Some of the difficulties that you'll see with students, um, I call, I mean, they're called, in the research literature, they're called psychological late effects, but you know, they're really reactions, ways of coping with some of the, some of the stressors and some of the difficulties. Um, and you could, with the exception of depression, you could lump them into um, 
ways of coping with stress where I tend to withdraw, I tend to pull away, um, I tend to avoid school or avoid others. Uh, there's something called selective mutism, which, it, which is children with leukemia are at higher risk for that. And that's kind of a, an, an anxiety that uh, affects how easy it is and how willing I am to communicate with words with, with, to people, particularly people I don't know. So, the, so these students might be described as, as being um, mute or very, very, very quiet and only talking to one or two very trusted people. The other side of the coin would be the students who cope with the stress and, 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 st and these reactions by becoming um, easily frustrated and um, irritable and um, more like the fight part of the fight or flight stress response. And then I, I, when I'm doing an assessment, I always keep in mind that distress includes physical symptoms. How, how's my body feeling when I'm upset? Am I, do I tend to get irritable and more, more energized, more, air, and more frustrated? Or do I tend to pull back and get tired and fatigued and low energy? The emotional symptoms, which we all kind of look for, the sadness, the anxiety, the irritability. And then the cognitive symptoms. Um, Someone who is depressed, the way, they, um, how easily they remember things changes. Um, the way, the way I focus when I'm feeling anxious changes. So there's always, there's always those three areas where I might find symptoms of, for, around distress. So some of the things that you might, that might be clues for you that you would have a student who, who would be struggling perhaps with some cognitive rate effects. If you'd start to see a student who is working more slowly, um, it, it's not a comprehension issue. It's a input and output, how quickly I can take information in and how quickly I can take uh, put it out. Um, I might look like I'm spacing out more. I might have trouble ignoring distractions. I might avoid school. About two thirds of survivors will develop some math difficulties. So you, I may my re, I may rely more and more on manipulatives to understand, especially when math is starting to stress number lines and uh, and be, and that mental uh, manipulation of information. I might start to have trouble with the pragmatics of writing. Um, I wish I could. That, that's the part. I, my spacing might not be so good anymore. My, you, you might pick that up in math or, or um, how I'm spacing in between words. Another sign of, of where you'd want to think, is this cognitive rate effect starting to come up, is all of a sudden discovering problems in, in those grades where the speed changes or the amount of responsibilities a student is is um, expected to juggle starts to change. So maybe it'd be around grade three, seven, or 10. And finally, if you've got a, a first grader or second grader who was treated as a three-year-old and everything was looking great, and but they're having trouble learning new skills. So that could show up in, in, in terms of reading difficulty. Adrian? Yeah. I'm just going to ask you to speak up a little louder. Our, the interpreter is a few feet away, and it, we're we're not. I'm hearing it there. Hearing. Thank you. Okay. Is this better? Much better. Okay, I'm holding it up now. There we go. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to share with you my model of how I understand. Um, the steps we all go through to learn something. If you were to imagine a triangle divided into three parts, and I'll be showing you this triangle later. At the bottom of the triangle is attention. That's the first step, taking information in. That's ignoring distractions and refocusing. And that's how quickly I can take information in. Now all that information is in is at the bottom of that first third of the triangle. Not the next level is memory. Not everybody remembers everything. So I'm going to lose a tremendous amount of that information that just came in. It's not important to remember. Whoop, it's out. 
a bit of more of that information goes into the second level of that triangle into my memory. I'm, I'm now memorizing that information. I'm learning it. I'm able to use it to solve problems. And then the very last piece of that triangle, it, and, I, and I call it the tip of the iceberg. It's the part that we look at when we do IQ testing or academic achievement testing. That's the problem solving piece. That's my ability to understand the, the, and explain the, the, my world to myself using language, using um, spatial skills, how things fit together, all that visual imagery, and my under, ability to understand social relationships, how my social skills are developing. There's a pattern of difficulties that you tend to see with students who have cognitive late effects. Um, that, develop, that, that, that for many students looks like a learning disability. A learning disability is an average IQ score. So the tip of that iceberg, that top of the triangle is fine. But there's lots of difficulties in the first, in the, in the first third of that triangle in terms of attention. I'm not picking information up well. If I've had radiation treatment, I will have difficulties possibly in that upper third of that um, of that triangle. But for most and for most students, especially the ones who have leukemia and lymphoma, we're really talking about the bottom third of that triangle. And that's possibly why um, people like me start to insist that we should do neuropsychological assessments on students, because the um, an IQ test doesn't always pick up those changes. The way the, the way some the way the, the other kinds of tests will do that. When you ask students what it feels like, They'll tell you things like this. The older students will be able to do, um, be able to compare themselves to before and say something's different. It feels slower. When I get it, I got it, but I just need a little bit more time. And a lot of them will describe feeling anxious about um, needing more time. You know, they just sort of, do I ask for it or do I try to ignore it? So why? Why are these things happening? So. We talked about how these difficulties develop slowly over time. And in the um, first few minutes of the presentation today, I talked about how all of the treatments, whether it's chemotherapy or radiation therapy or surgery, are, are affecting the brain in some way. There's a Chemotherapy and radiation treatment are successful because they affect, they kill cancer cells. These cells are rapidly dividing and changing. But it's not, um, they're equal opportunity. They affect all cells that are equally, that, that are dividing quickly. That's why people lose their hair. Hair, hair follicles divide quickly. That's why you hear about people talking about nausea and stomach upset because the lining of your stomach cells and your gut and your throat, all those cells divide and renew quickly. At certain times in a child's life, brain cells are also dividing and renewing quickly. And so under the age of five, there's a lot of there's a lot of a certain kind of cell being developed. And that's the picture I just shared with you. It's called myelin. It's, this is, a, this is a, a neuron or a brain cell. And the myelin are all these, um, these light colored blue lumpy. Uh, ah, um, they look like beads. Sorry, they look like beads. Um, it's an insulation along the parts of the brain cell that communicate to other parts of the brain cell. I think about it as, um, you know, if, you, if you're gonna plug something into the wall, the electric cord has a white, has, has the white plastic around it, and that's an insulation. It's the same thing. Thanks to that white insulation around the electric cord, the electricity goes from one point to the next. It goes there quickly. There's no, there's, um, there's no interference. And that's what myelin does too. It, it lets brain cells communicate more quickly with one another. Messages transfer much more quickly. They don't get lost. They don't ricochet to, to places they shouldn't get to, shouldn't go to. 
if you think of the, the way a four-year-old's attention is and compare it to ha what's happened even a year later when they're five, you see the impact, the one of kids learning how to focus and pay attention and wonderful educational systems, but you also see the impact of myelin. Thanks to the myelin, that's what's also happening. That's why you know, it can feel like night and day between a child being able to sit and listen to a story and not being able to listen to a story. These are the things that happen. So these are the cells responsible for letting us focus, ignore what we need to ignore. They help us with working memory, which is that place, that temporary place in our brains where we can juggle information and do mental math in our head and figure out um, that, well, at least for me, that pair of pants is 60% off, so how much is it really? That's what, they're responsible for that. They, there's more of those um, cells in the right side of my brain than the left side of my brain. If you were to divide my brain in half, the right side has more myelin in it. And the right side, for many of us, tends to be more involved with understanding the world when um, pictures are involved and visual imagery and spatial kinds of things. So that's why spatial skills are affected. Um, math is very dependent on working memory skills and spatial skills. That's why students who have these kinds of myelin-related changes due to treatment are at a higher risk for math difficulties. So I mentioned that not everybody gets these, though. It's not um, just because you have a student in your class that had this kind of treatment, we can't assume that they will have these kinds of learning. We can assume that they'll have short-term learning problems, but we can't assume that they'll have long-term difficulties. So how do we predict who's going to need them? Um, hopefully, in 10 years or so, we'll also have genetic markers to be able to predict it a little more accurately, but right now, um, what the research is telling us is that girls are at higher risk than boys. So one time that's actually not good to be a girl. Usually boys are at higher risk for early childhood kinds of things, but here it's girls. Um, children under the age of nine are at higher risk for these kinds of difficulties, especially under the age of five. So if they were treated under the age of five, we're going to watch them carefully. If they got radiation treatment under the age of five, they're at very, very high risk. So we're gonna watch them very very closely. And if they've got a dose, if here it says 24 CGY. And that's just, a, that's the way they measure doses of uh, radiation. The average radiation dose for someone with a brain tumor is six weeks of about 50. So. If, you, if you're working with a student who's had radiation treatment, chances are that they're at high risk and we want to watch them carefully. A, 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 a student with a brain tumor who immediately following surgery had difficulties is at much higher risk for learning problems. Also, a student with a brain tumor who had radiation treatment who had something called um, it, who, a syndrome that makes them very, very sleepy for a couple of weeks when after radiation treatment is over. They'll sleep 15, 18 hours a day. And we don't know why that raises the risk of these kinds of difficulties. The type of chemotherapy, the name of the chemotherapy that impacts this the most is called methotrexate. And it's, it's the drug that is responsible for really having um, cured leukemia. So every child with leukemia gets this drug. And then students who have the bone marrow transplant that we mentioned earlier, if they, as part of their bone, mal bone um, marrow transplant, ended up getting body radiation or got a donor stem cell from somebody who's not a family member, they tend to have a higher risk of of difficulties as well. So those are those are the students that we're looking at. So what are the risks for students who have uh, stem cell transplants? 
um, because their pattern is a little bit different than what I've just been talking about. Their pattern tends to follow a course over several years and doesn't involve changes in spatial skills the way it does with kids who have leukemia and um, brain tumors. So what you'll see is as early as one year after the bone marrow tra transplant, in addition to any kinds of difficulties that they might have because they missed anywhere from three to six months of school, um, is changes in visual, in visual motor skills. So that's that um, fine motor skills and short-term memory. Three years later, this group of kids, their visual motor skills tend to have improved and their short-term memory has gotten better, but they, they may be having more difficulties with forgetfulness especially around um, verbal kinds of information, that narratives, uh, the kinds of things that I'm doing right now where I'm lecturing or in a classroom, those sorts of things. And then five years later, in a very small group of these students, the ones who are most affected, we, we will see a drop in IQ scores. So one of the things when you guys are working with students and you, if you discover that they did have a bone marrow transplant, several years ago. It's always, and um, if they're not being followed by our program, it's always a good thing to refer them back because we can help some of the assessments around that. Um, with children with brain tumors, I'm not gonna talk a, a lot about um, the nuts and bolts of this because every person's brain develops a little bit differently and it's hard to draw a lot of comparisons across the students who have, with brain tumors because um, the, their, early, their early environment makes a difference, um, where the brain tumor is makes a difference, as well as uh, the kinds of help that they receive afterwards. But um, if you put your hand on the back of your head and you feel that sort of bump back there, that's the posterior fossa region. That's the place for, that is the most common area for brain tumors for children and youth. In adults, it tends to be more just behind your eyes in the, in the, in the cortex. So right off the bat, if you know adults, if, if what you know about brain tumors is based on adults, a lot of it doesn't apply to children. With children, the kinds of difficulties that they tend to have most related to their brain tumors tend to have a lot to do with attention, information processing, and if they received a lot of radiation treatment, memory, and perhaps IQ scores. So going back to what kids say and how they describe this, these are now comments of students who are having cognitive late effects, who, who, ha, who know, who have the ability to kind of look and see what kind of learners they are and know what sort of things help. So this student notices that they need more time, that part of needing more time is that it, it affects how quickly they can take notes. So being able to have someone else share their notes with them so that they're studying from the same from the same amount of information as everybody else makes a big difference. And then having somebody help with the scribe and the, with the fine motor difficulties also makes a big difference. Okay. We've talked about IQ scores and how IQ scores can change. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that. And if you would like my slides, I'm happy to share them with you. The last thing I, I want to talk about before we talk a little bit, I want to spend a bit more time talking about attention with what we, the time we have left, is we've talked a lot about what happens immediately during treatment, how those kinds of learning issues are related to fatigue and short-term side effects, um, maybe due to the nausea and the fatigue and, and the, the sleepiness that happens from nausea medication. Um, or immediate short-term difficulties related to the brain tumor. With time, three to five years for students with leukemia, you can start to see a pattern of uh, changes in information processing speed and working memory and, and, how, um, and in spatial skills and where working memory and spatial skills problems can impact math. 
for younger children, it can hurt um, early, uh, early skill acquisition, especially around reading. But then once they start to really master their reading skills, that difficulty seems to disappear. So it looks like it's more of a learning to learn difficulty with reading as opposed to the math disability that, stu that, the, that the other group is, is at risk of. Um, we talked about how the bone marrow transplant, you, tend to, it's, you don't see that pattern so much. It's, it tends to be changes over time that you want to be watching for. Change, uh, things get better and a couple things get worse. Then there's something very, very rare, which is this slide here. And it happens, in, it happens once people are, are adults. Remember we were talking about how side effects or late effects due to cancer treatment can take 20 years afterwards. So in a, a small group of, of uh, now they're young adults, 20 years post-treatment, you see difficulties with, with headaches. Um, and focal, what is focal neurologic dysfunction? Those are pockets of difficulty. So diff maybe difficult, increasing difficulties with fine motor skills, increasing difficulties maybe with peripheral vision or increasing difficulties with long-term memory as well. So in a very small group of young adults, um, these difficulties can worsen. Um, I, oh, I wanna emphasize that it is a very small group, but because it is present, it is something that students worry about and more than that, their parents worry about. So uh, those of you, when you're working with high school students who are having difficulties, it is something in the back of people's mind. And I just wanted to give you that information so that um, you also know what's, um, what people are thinking about when we talk about, oh, it looks like they're having more difficulties. This is, this is something that, that people wonder about. It, again, we can't, um, it's, at this point, we can't predict who, that, who, who might have that difficulty, so we follow it. And, uh, and all I'm going to say is one more time that it's very rare. So um, there's lots and lots of room for hope, but we always have to watch. So here's that, um, that triangle I was making you imagine. And I apologize for making you imagine it, but um, being the, the, the brain nerd that I am, I know that it, when, you're, when you can't see the speaker and you're just looking at a at a, a, a non-moving screen, it can be really hard to take what you're listening to and turn it into memories. And the more I can engage you as listeners, the more likely it is that you will take some of this away. And the thing, if you remember one thing about my presentation, I want you to remember this triangle. Because it's, it's an, it's, to me, it's an easy way to remember and understand how cognitive late effects can impact someone. At the bottom, you got a ten, well, just below at the very bottom of the triangle information about the world. How is that getting in? Where is it going? You've got arrows all over the place. Some of it gets into our memory. Not everybody remembers everything, so some of it flies out. And at the very tip of the iceberg, we have the problem, problem solving piece. So where am I? Um, what can I access from my brain and from the world in order to give you the best answer I possibly can? I'd like to spend the eight minutes I have left to talk to you a bit more about attention because attention matters deeply here. So often, we think of attention and we think of, atten oh, it's an attention span. It's how long can somebody focus? And then that's the big piece. But re it really is the first step in learning and critical in knowing how you feel. Being able to know where to put your attention makes all the difference in the world. And we know with the children who have cognitive late effects that there are things that we can do to help their brains develop attention skills that have a huge impact on their math skills and their spatial skills. Um, there are studies in Toronto where students are doing fun team sports and exercise several years after being treated for a brain tumor. And three times a week, after three months, you can measure the growth in the parts of the brain that are most involved in focus. So there are, there are definitely things we can do. Um, and BrainWorks does, will share that information with schools and with, with um, 
families too. And I could come back and talk for two hours, Sarah, about that. Um, so what is attention? Attention is all these things. Attention um, lets you notice things. It, it lets you invite friendships. It, they, they say that the surest sign of knowing somebody loves you is how well they focus and pay attention to you. And that's perhaps why um, I can spend hours and hours talking about how important attention is because I think if we can improve students' abilities to focus and pay attention, um, it impacts every part of their life, but most importantly, it impacts their ability to build relationships with others and engage with life. The trouble is that attention is a very limited resource. There's not enough to go around. So the brain directs attention to that which it thinks is most relevant. There's always, always going to be more information out there than what, than what, um, than what you can process. And so the dilemma is how quickly can you work with the information and the impact that the world on the outside is, is, in, is having in, its, in your ability to continue to pay attention, as well as the impact that you're having on the inside to be able to pay attention. So how, how do we know where to direct our attention with this lim greatly limited resource? I wanna leave you guys with a, nut, a, a second model. I gave you the triangle, which is your brain model, but I'm gonna leave you with a second model of attention. And that the, the first part of the model is happening right here in this slide. It's called bottom up attention. It's the most basic attention there is. It's, it's, it's connected between your eyeballs and the back of your brain, the parietal lobe. And it's designed to only to focus on what's most important for my survival and it's driven by my senses mostly hearing and vision it pays attention to anything that's shiny that's bright that's um rushing past you as you're trying to cross the street all of those really important things when the makers of iphones and tv commercials use this kind of attention to to grab you over and over again Biologically, we're designed to pay attention to anything that flashes. Think of how often a phone flashes, right? Commercials are flashing all the time. This is why I, I had mentioned to you that the worst thing a student with brain fatigue can do is to watch TV or spend time on their phone is because it, this kind of attention is being triggered over and over and over again. If you're, and so there's no rest, there's no brain rest. If you're having anxiety, this kind of attention takes over your brain. You've, you've seen that. You, I've said, oh, I was so nervous. I was running around like a chicken without a head. I couldn't focus. I was, I was here. I was there. I was everywhere. That's what this attention is. It's designed to be here, there, and everywhere with very little long-term focus. We need it to survive. This is where speed comes in. When we talked about information processing speed, thanks to this kind of bottom-up attention, it lets us react quickly, it lets us decide on what to do, and quickly make that response. I'm going to skip this slide because we talked about it all, those two a lot. But there has to be more to attention. If all we had was going from here and there and everywhere, there would be no learning because that you just be you'd be like this guy Homer Simpson who we all know who who's goes from one impulse to the next. So there's a part of our brain that lets us focus that lets us take our attention this here there everywhere bottoms up kind of attention and lets us listen to the teacher when there are other ha things happening in the classroom let's ag ignore the child behind us and come back to what we're supposed to be focusing on. And that happens in two ways. The first way is teachers limit the bottom up hijacking of attention. When teachers say, look at me, look over here, they tap on the desk, they're directing 
they're making some kind of visual or sound cue, you're, you, they're stopping this bottom-up attention from hijacking the brain. They're also making it easier for a student to process more quickly. Um, teachers do this when they take advantage of that wanting to be creative in the novelty seeking part of, of, of a child. Let, let me see this, let me see this, let me see this, and then gear it to interesting topics. That's another way of taking this very normal, natural, bottom up kind of attention and using it for learning. When you encourage any kind of game that, that, that it focuses on small, an attention to small details, that's another way of improving focus by using this kind of innate ability to just have my attention be here, there, and everywhere. But that's not enough, right? That's it. Then it's always you doing it. It's always the environment driving the attention. And this is such an important skill to learn as kids are getting older. So there's something called top-down attention. So if you remember, I showed you a brain picture with fatigue at the beginning of this talk and showed you how attention is everywhere in your brain. And now you see why. Because half of your brain is involved in the bottom up, the other half is involved in the top down. And the top down attention, this is your secret weapon in school. And it improves with maturity and with practice. When I talk to you about the, those studies in Toronto where we're able to measure the growth of the brain centers that are involved in attention, this is the part of the brain that's growing. This is the part of the brain that the brain that develops um, through mat through probably through your early 20s. So there's lots of room and time for hope. This is the part of the brain that lets um, pulls your attention back to where it needs to be. So this this joke here is bottoms up attention. I'm, my attention is here, there, and everywhere. And as teachers, what we're trying to do is, is focus on what can we do to get ah, Bart Simpson using the other part of his brain to learn. With children who have cancer and who have the attention difficulties, whether they be short-term difficulties, or the long-term late effects difficulties. Everything that we do to help the top-down attention, that piece of attention skill, uh, that keep the focus, that grow the attention span, that minimize the impact, the negative impact that slow thinking has on learning will do great things to help students be successful and compensate for difficulties with the bottom up, that slow, that that um, the bottom up attention, that slower abil that ability to focus quickly, which has become slow, whether it's short term because of medications or fatigue, or long term because of changes to the myelin in that part of the brain.